Well, hello, listeners. Welcome back. My name is Stephanie Safarian, and you're listening to episode 338 of Sustainable Minimalists, a twice-weekly show about intentional and eco-minimalist living. On today's show, we are kicking off Chocolate Week, in which we are covering my favorite food group in not one, but two episodes. After listening to these two episodes on chocolate, I am confident you will be able to impress all your friends with your superior knowledge about chocolate, yes, but more importantly, I am very confident that you will be able to purchase chocolate with more intention because you'll be armed with the knowledge you need to make ethical and environmental chocolate purchasing decisions. So a big thank you to listener Kathleen from New Zealand who suggested I cover this issue on the show. Before we get into today's episode, I just want to lay out the groundwork of what we're doing today and what we're doing on Thursday. So today, we are discussing the ethical and the environmental issues associated with cultivating cacao. On Thursday's show, which by the way is an interview, we're switching things this week. Today you've got just me, on Thursday you've got your interview. So on Thursday's show, we're discussing the human health issues associated with cacao. Maybe you've heard something in the news lately about the alarming, the very alarming, I should say, percentages of heavy metals, including lead, in the chocolate supply. We're talking about that with an expert on Thursday. So... How is chocolate made? Any ideas? We're going to go through it really, really quick. But chocolate is made from the cacao bean. It's also referred to as cocoa. So I might use cacao and cocoa, the terms interchangeably today. But cacao grows mostly in tropical climates. Generally, if you want to really impress your friends, within 20 degrees of latitude from the equator. So the vast majority of cacao comes from West Africa. I'm talking the Ivory Coast, Ghana, Nigeria. But cacao does grow in other locations. Ecuador is a big area. Indonesia is another one. The majority of chocolate comes from West Africa. What happens are the cacao beans are grown and harvested. Here's a little fun fact. The cacao pods, which hold the beans, grow exactly off the trunk of the plant. So not off the branches, but off the trunk. So the pods are harvested. The pods are opened, usually with a machete. The beans are exposed. The cacao seeds are removed. The rind is discarded. Then the pulp and the seeds are piled up in heaps and laid out in the sun for several days to dry. The technical term is sweat, but we've got to get the moisture out of there so that they don't mold as they are placed in shipping containers and sent generally to Europe. Then, you know, the nibs are ground to make cocoa butter. If we're making milk chocolate, we're adding an awful lot of milk as well as sugar and other ingredients to make the milk chocolate flavor. The mixture is then mixed, thickened, and then poured into molds, wrapped up, and then shipped around the world in the form of a chocolate bar. We're not talking about those later steps today. I'm just giving you a little bit of background information. Today, we're really just talking about step number one, the growing and the harvesting of the cacao bean. What are the ethical and environmental issues associated with that. And let's just get the spoiler alert out of the way. There are many issues associated with cacao cultivation. So let's get right into the human ethical issues associated with chocolate. And for my parents listening, I want you to think about your kids and think about whether you would give them a machete. Would you give them a machete? Would you let them play with a machete? I have a almost nine-year-old and an almost six-year-old. There is no way in heck I would ever give them a machete. And I want you to ask yourself whether you could give your kids a machete because the vast majority, 70% of the world's cacao supply comes from West Africa, where child labor is frequently documented. The U.S. Labor Department estimates that anywhere between 1.5 and 2 million child laborers are working on their parents' small cacao farms in Western African countries. Some children are even trafficked in, so child slavery. 
And I mentioned the machete there because, of course, the cacao pod is growing on the tree. They are removed from the tree and then they are hacked open often with a machete. This is, I shouldn't have to say this, but I'll say it. This is extremely dangerous work, right? Especially for children. Children have also been documented as being the sprayers of the pesticides, which obviously is also dangerous work. The problem here is that the origin of cocoa beans, where exactly they came from, what farm they grew on, it is largely untraceable. The biggest chocolate brands, so I'm talking Hershey's, Mars, Nestle, they cannot, and when asked, they could not guarantee that their chocolates were produced without child labor. They can't guarantee that children did not go into producing that chocolate bar. The reason why they can't determine whether children were used in the harvesting of the cacao is because they can't even tell where the chocolate came from in the first place. This sounds like a big fat problem, doesn't it? It is. And the reason cacao is so untraceable is because it takes 25 tons of it to fill just one shipping container. So when you think about a shipping container, I want you to think about one of those gigantic metal boxes that are stacked onto other gigantic metal boxes that are then stacked with intention so that not an inch of space is wasted onto a cargo ship. So it takes 25 whopping tons of cacao to fill just one shipping container. That means that it's not just one cacao farm, one small family-owned cacao farm that's filling up a shipping container. No, no, no. That shipping container is filled by countless beans from countless farms. And that's where the traceability problem comes into play. If you're listening right now and you're thinking to yourself, why on earth has this problem not been tackled before. It has been attempted to be tackled before. In 2001, specifically, news organizations came up with plenty of reports, as well as the U.S. State Department, too. They published reports that linked American chocolate to child slavery in West Africa. People were up in arms, right? Legislation was introduced to create a federal labeling system that would show whether child slavery was used in the production of that chocolate. Talk about unappetizing, right? Think about if you go to the grocery store and you go to pick up your bag of, for me, it's always Reese's peanut butter cups. Uh, You go to pick up your bag of Reese's peanut butter cups and on it, it says in big, bold letters, Child slavery was used in the production of these Reese's peanut butter cups. Well, I just lost my appetite for those Reese's right then and there. That would have been a powerful label that would have been federally mandated to be put on chocolate. Well, a couple problems here. The bill only passed in the House because the industry, of course, lobbied the heck out of it. They did want to avoid federal oversight. They did later that year... The major heads, they did sign what was named the Harkin Angle Protocol, which was a deal to keep federal regulators out of the equation. So the Harkin Angle Protocol said, we don't want federal oversight. We don't want the federal government to police the chocolate supply, but we will sign this and we will promise to eliminate, quote, the worst forms of child labor. So they sign this paper, they say they're going to do it, but then the major chocolate companies, they proceed to miss deadlines in 2005, in 2008, in 2010. And in 2011, an exact decade, so 10 exact years after signing the Harkin Engel Protocol, these industry officials essentially gave up the task. An industry group that represented Hershey, Mars, and Nestle, and other companies stated that the chocolate industry does not know of any certification system that can guarantee the absence of child labor, including trafficked labor, in the production of cocoa in West Africa. So the Harkins Engel Protocol, the chocolate industry's attempt at policing itself, was abandoned. So where are we today? That was 12 years ago. Where are we today? 
According to The Economist, the number of children working in sub-Saharan Africa, so in this cacao-growing region of Africa, began to increase starting in 2012. And as of 2021, 24% of all children in sub-Saharan Africa work. 24% of all children. Think about your child's class. Does your child have, I don't know, 25 kids in their class? According to the 24% of all children in sub-Saharan Africa working statistic, in your child's class of 25 children, six of them would work. Six of them would work with machetes, no less. That number is according to The Economist. Research from the University of Chicago, however, found a different number. They said two-fifths, 43% of all children aged between 5 and 17 that grow in cocoa-growing regions of Ghana and the Ivory Coast are engaged in hazardous work. So let's move on to the environmental issues with regard to chocolate. Well, of course, as with any monoculture, there's deforestation. The Ivory Coast has lost more than 80% of its forests in the last 50 years, mostly due to the production of cacao. Cacao is most commonly harvested in areas where poverty runs rampant, right? So that leads farmers to deforest in order to enlarge their farms so they can make enough money to survive. We cut down forests so we can plant more crop, so we can make a little bit more money and continue to live. Cacao also needs full sun to grow best. So surrounding trees are cut down so that the plant can have more sun for more hours of the day. It's important to note here too that in the case of cacao, in the case of palm oil, in the case of the coffee bean, the ethical issues around the monocrop And the environmental ones are so intricately intertwined. Most male cocoa farmers make $1 a day. And most female cocoa farmers make only 30 cents a day. And that's because the price of the crop, in this case cacao, has fallen so low. What does this mean for the farmer? They are struggling to survive amidst deep poverty And they are unable to afford improvements onto their farm. They are unable to plant or reintroduce other trees and shrubs because it's simply too expensive. So the farmer's poverty underlies, at the end of the day, the environmental destruction that's happening in these areas that produce cacao. So the poverty explains the environmental destruction. It also explains the need for child laborers. More hands to harvest more of the crop yields slightly more money as they continue their struggle to survive. One other quick unrelated but kind of related environmental concern associated with chocolate is cocoa is almost always grown, not always, but quite, quite often grown with pesticides. Uh, The plant is notorious for falling prey to capsid bugs. Pesticides are used to combat them. And then pod disease is another uh, potential crop killer of cacao. And so fungicides are often placed on the plant to combat against pod disease. So we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we are going to continue the conversation. I'll see you in a minute. Thrive Market is my go-to for all of my grocery and household essentials because as a Thrive member, I save money on every single order. On average, I save 30%. Not only does Thrive Market save me money, they also save me lots of time. I love the filters on their website and their app. They have over 70 of them. And so whether you're looking for a certified gluten-free or non-toxic cleaning, You can curate your own shopping experience with the click of a button. For me, certified organic is really darn important. And so I just click the certified organic filter and off I go. There's no deciphering of those confusing product labels for me. Join Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash sustainable for 30% off your first order plus a free gift. That's T-H-R-I-V. V-E market.com slash sustainable 
thrivemarket.com slash sustainable. If you're not sleeping on bed sheets with viscose from bamboo yet, what on earth are you waiting for? I used to be a cotton bed sheets type of girl, and then I tried Caraloha's soft and sustainable bedding made from viscose from bamboo. You guys, the difference is huge. It is one of the softest and comfiest fabrics on the planet. They're also cooler. Viscose from bamboo fabrics are three degrees cooler than non-bamboo fabrics, and they're naturally moisture wicking, which means they're lightweight and breathable. And even my husband, who, let's be real, he generally does not care too much about our bed sheets, but even he prefers our Caraloha sheets over our humdrum cotton ones. Caraloha is giving our listeners 25% off their order by using code SUSTAINABLE. The code does not last forever, so hurry and head to C-A-R-I-L-O-H-A dot com and use code SUSTAINABLE to receive 25% off your order. And we're back on today's show. We are discussing all things ethical and environmental as it relates to chocolate. As a reminder, this is part one of a two-part show on my favorite food group. (laughs) Before the break, I left you with some pretty sobering news with regard to child labor, child slavery, and environmental destruction as it relates to the growing of cacao. And I feel bad that I left you in such a depressed space. So there are some promising updates, and I'm going to lay a couple of them out for you right now. The National Wildlife Federation, I've had them on the show before, by the way, but they are currently working on satellite mapping and monitoring systems for cocoa farms that will monitor both human exploitation and deforestation. So It seems to me that the biggest problem when it comes to cacao is the traceability. If you can't trace it, if you don't know where the problem is, you can't solve the problem. So I love that the National Wildlife Federation is tackling this. In 2017, the governments of the Ivory Coast and Ghana, as well as 35 major chocolate companies, joined together to form the Cocoa and Forests Initiative, which pledged to end deforestation and reforest areas that were negatively affected by full sun cocoa farming. Fair trade cocoa farmers in the Ivory Coast increased their household incomes by 85% between the years 2018 to 2021. So thank you to Fair Trade for that. And thank you to the European Union, because in 2022, just last year, the EU passed a law that bans the import of products linked to deforestation. We're on to the part of the show where we're discussing how on earth to find sustainable and ethical chocolate. You love your chocolate? You want to keep eating it? Okay, so let's buy better chocolate, right? I have some hints for you. The number one best thing you can do is to buy chocolate that comes from traceable cocoa. How do you find those things? Well, on the package, it would say something like single origin or bean to bar or some other phrasing that indicates that the company knows exactly where the cocoa came from. Okay, if you can't find a chocolate bar that comes with traceable cocoa, look for chocolate with a third-party certification. Fair Trade, Rainforest Alliance, That doesn't mean the cocoa is traceable, but there are at least some sort of external audit to monitor for child labor and deforestation practices. So if you can't find traceable cocoa, look for a third-party certification. Look also for chocolate companies that have a direct connection with farmers because the farmers are more likely then to be paid a higher wage. There is no direct trade certification that doesn't exist yet, but the companies who do have a direct connection with a farm or a farmer will definitely advertise it. They will advertise the heck out of that. Stay away from chocolate that has palm oil listed as an ingredient. Anything with palm oil, especially chocolate, is generally not high quality. It's a low quality fat, so look for chocolates with cacao butter only. Side note here, if you missed my episode on palm oil, I had an amazing conversation with award-winning journalist Jocelyn Zuckerman all about the problems associated with palm oil. That was episode number 187, and I'll link to it in the show notes if you missed it. But if you like this episode, you're going to like the episode on palm oil. Well and good 
came out with a list of small chocolate companies that they would consider sustainable and ethical. I've linked to that article in the show notes if you're interested. Remember to look for craft chocolate as opposed to chocolate made from a mega corporation. Not all craft chocolate is ethical or sustainable, but chances are real good that it's better than some of the other things on the shelf. Look and see if a chocolate maker is transparent. If they're naming where the beans are from, if they're naming the farmer, those are all good signs. And you're never going to see that in chocolate from mega corporations. And if you're wondering, well, how do I find whether they're transparent or not? Just go to their social media or their website. Those are great places to start. Beware of greenwashing too. Smaller chocolate companies can and do make themselves look ethical and sustainable, but then use cheap and unethical and unsustainable cacao. So beware of greenwashing too. I suggest as a practical tip, if your family loves chocolate, find a small chocolate company whose chocolate you enjoy and just purchase only for them. So do your research once. And then once you're sure that you feel good about that chocolate, Purchase only from them. So perhaps you go to Well and Goods article, you find a brand on there that matches your values, and you start purchasing only from them. So for Halloween, you're giving out the good stuff, right? You're not giving out the the mega corporations, little snack bars. You're giving out the good stuff for Christmas, for Valentine's Day coming up. All of it, you're giving that one brand because you can feel confident about that brand. I should also say here too, it was the same with eggs. It's the same with anything, right? Buy the best you can afford. A chocolate bar should cost you like at least $10, maybe $12 in today's inflation life. (laughs) If it costs less than $10, it's not as high quality and it's definitely not ethical, right? If If it's cheap, either the farmers weren't paid or you're compromising on quality. So be willing to spend $10, $12, $15 even on a bar of chocolate. And my final tip for you today is something that I need to (laughs) work on in my own life, which is to start viewing chocolate as more of a treat, like not a nightly, let's eat it on the couch type of thing. (laughs) I love chocolate. I really do. And I eat it most days. But if I'm spending $12 on a chocolate bar, on an ethical chocolate bar, um, My finances as a podcast host do not allow me to eat chocolate, $12 chocolate on the couch every night. So take a step away from chocolate as like this nightly treat and more of as like a special occasion or a once in a while treat. And again, I'm working on that myself personally. So today we talked about the ethical and the environmental considerations associated with the harvesting of cacao. On Thursday's episode, be sure to stick around because that's when we're discussing the human health implications associated with cacao harvesting. Recent research has found that there are gigantic amounts of lead and cadmium, two heavy metals in the chocolate supply. We're going to speak to one of the research leaders into these findings. Um, And if you don't know anything about cadmium, no big deal, we'll cover it on Thursday, but you know lead, you know lead. (laughs) No amount is safe, right? So no amount of lead is found to be safe for humans, yet it's in our chocolate supply. So we're gonna get down and dirty with that on Thursday. I will see you then. Reach out if you need me. See you Thursday.